Transitional periods in historical fashion are always intriguing. The Edwardian era to me is one of the most beautiful and what women were wearing in the time transitioning from the Edwardians to World War I is very interesting as well because you have such a drapey feminine look in the Edwardian era that suddenly needs to become very practical. And you can see a change in the blouse moving from an Edwardian blouse with layers of lace and soft fabrics and a long flowing look about it into what we have now termed as the armistice blouse, which is still very soft and feminine, but it has that more modern look. World War I definitely brings in the modern fashion that we're more familiar with today. The armistice blouse and the clothes that led up to it are a great addition to a historically inspired wardrobe because they're not quite as different in structure as much older garments are. Fashion from World War I is now crossing over from the vintage to the antique category, being that it's a hundred years old now. And to celebrate that change, along with being heavily inspired by my being a fan of Downton Abbey, I want to recreate an outfit that is similar to one we see Lady Mary wear a lot in Season 2. Not a direct copy, but maybe one that wouldn't look out of place beside her or in that environment. So I'm making a slight precursor to the armistice blouse. This one has a slightly older, um, I guess it's been called a kimono style sleeve, where the sleeve and the front and the back are all cut from the same piece. And it has a stomacher like panel in the front and the back. There are some conscious changes that I'm making to my version of this blouse. One is to use fabric that isn't quite so see-through. I won't have three layers underneath it, so I actually don't want it to be able to show. So I've chosen some really nice lightweight cotton fabric with a woven stripe. This is a pattern that I have actually made myself, but it's very, very simple if you want to make your own. Because it's so loose and the arm is part of the body of the shirt, there won't be any shoulder seam or armhole seam to fit. It makes it very simple. As a side note, if you have a fear of sleeves, this is a great style to incorporate into your sewing because you don't have to fit a sleeve. The drapiness of hanging off the shoulder is part of the look of the actual blouse and you don't have a shoulder seam. You just have under the arm and then down the side seam. So it's pretty simple that way if you have a fear of fitting a sleeve. A general rule that I practice is however you're going to wash the final garment, you want to wash the fabric that way first, whether it's in the washing machine or hand washed or dry cleaned or what have you. So I lay out my pattern on my fabric. I like to use pattern weights rather than pins on something that is as stable as a cotton. If you're going to sew with a shear, then you probably want to pin it or baste it to the pattern, something like that, because shears move so bad. But if it's just a light to medium weight cotton or linen, then pattern weights work really well. These I actually found in the toy department of one of our local stores and I thought they were really heavy to be given to the kids as toys because I am sure that at some point having boys one of them was going to chuck one at another but I thought they would make the perfect pattern weights. So don't be afraid to think outside the box when it comes to pattern weights. When cutting out my patterns I always like to keep the fabric with its pattern piece for as long as possible just so that I don't end up with a big pile of cutout pieces and forget which one goes where or accidentally use a front side instead of a back side or something like that. For the front panel, I decided that I liked the stripes actually running horizontally in contrast to the rest of the shirt, which was running vertically. I think it's going to complement the lines of the lapels and the collar versus the lines for the trim across the front. Now I have seen kimono style patterns where they actually run a single piece from the front to the back. The blouse that Lady Mary wears in Downton Abbey is this way, so there's no top shoulder seam. However, I wanted to put some insert lace in my blouse down the sleeve just to kind of accentuate the top shoulder and make it less droopy. My fear through this whole thing was that I was gonna make something that would make me look like a pillow with a string tied in the middle. So I wanted to keep it loose I knew when I made my fabric choice that it wasn't going to have the drape of the originals because I am using a slightly thicker fabric. And so putting a little insert lace gives it somewhere to fold and hang and drape without being too bulky. There is a very common way of applying your insert lace. 
and that is to apply it to a flat sheet of fabric. So in this case, you would have actually cut the front and back out of one piece and then lay your insert lace across the top, sew it down, and then snip the fabric out from underneath it, roll it up and hem it, and then have that be your complete insert lace. I have some Edwardian dresses where it's actually very clearly not done this way. Wherever there's insert lace between two pattern pieces, those pieces are, they're roll hemmed and whip stitched, and then the insert lace is put in between them in the final construction of the dress. So that's how I'm going to do it here. I'm going to just roll hem the edge of the pattern piece and then insert my lace between them with a whip stitch. And I've said this before, but whether I've sewn the roll hem by hand or by machine, I still like to hand sew the lace onto the fabric, especially on something where the pieces are as small as on a blouse. If I'm doing the bottom of a really full petticoat and I have yards and yards and yards of it, and since it's the bottom of a ruffle, no one's gonna really see it anyway, then I might use a machine to do it. But on something that has small pieces like a blouse, I'll generally do it by hand because when you're looking at bobbin lace, you wanna try and catch the right threads when you're attaching it to the blouse. Bobbin lace is a woven lace, so it has threads that travel back and forth across the lace. And you can see the pairs. They go in and they go out and then they go around the edge. And then they go in and they go out and they go around the edge. It seems like what you would wanna do is catch this edge thread to sew to. But you don't, because if you pull on it, you're gonna distort the lace. It's actually kind of a weak point of the lace. Ideally, what you wanna do is grab one of the traveling pairs or the working pairs that go back and forth, because if you grab that, then you've got at least four threads being used along the edge. So you can see when you tug on it, it's very even, and you're not gonna have some threads pulled more than others because you're actually following the pattern of the lace down attaching it to the blouse. So being able to choose exactly what threads you're using and where you're placing your needle is definitely a plus in hand sewing your insertion lace onto your fabric. You're just not gonna be able to get that kind of choice and control on your machine. Now that I'm done sewing the lace to the front side of the piece, I'll just match it up to the back side and finish sewing it down the other side. So now that I have my insert lace sewn in, then I'm just sewing up the seam that runs under the arm and down the side. Make sure you put a little snip in the crook of the arm so it doesn't pucker there when you turn it right side out. Attaching the embroidered point to the front panel was kind of tricky. I didn't want any top stitching and I didn't want any seams or raw edges to show. So I sewed the right side of the point to the wrong side of the front panel. Then I clipped the edges really close then did this funny twisty thing so that all of the raw edges were on the inside. It's not really a French seam or a French hem and it's not really a rolled hem. It's kind of, I don't know, just a funny twisty thing. There might be a real word for it, I'm not sure. And then sewed that down so that when the front point is kind of flipped over the front, it will look like it's just folded hanging there rather than severely stitched there. I did kind of the same thing for the back. The back was gonna be flat across, not pointed. Admittedly, most of this blouse is done by eye and kind of made up as I went along. I do try to have some kind of picture going into it, but it rarely ends up how I intend in the beginning. I have a lot of really beautiful pictures of moodily lit lace and ribbons and things that I actually didn't end up using in the blouse at all. Oh well, such is the creative process, right? So I've basically duplicated the sewing for the back as well as the front. Next I hemmed the center of the blouse so that I can attach it onto the stomacher front and back. And I definitely suggest doing this before you finish, whether you're felling or French seaming or whatever it is you're doing to the underarm side seam. You want to do this part first because when you try your fitting, that's the part, the underarm part is the part that you're going to adjust your fitting with. 
because this blouse is pretty much all just by eye and making it up as I go, I decided to place the front and back plackets or stomacher or whatever you want to call them on the dress form. You could do it on your own body in front of a mirror, but if you have a dress form, it's a lot easier to do this kind of free form drapey type sewing with a dress form. So I put the side panels on with the sleeves, lined everything up where I wanted it to be, and just decide how far up the back I wanted this. Did I want a low back? Did I want a high back? And I think that this seems about right for me. And this is a really good time to adjust the drape. You can have a very narrow opening. You can have a wide straight opening. They're just going to affect the drape a little differently, whether you want the look of being cinched in at the waist or whether you want it to be kind of loose and flat and straight. Then once I had the back all figured out and was happy with how it sat on my frame, I went to the front and pinned that into place this is where you're going to decide exactly how high you want the front of your blouse, how wide you want the opening of your blouse. And you may have noticed that there aren't any zippers or buttons or hooks or anything in this. And it's because it's a loose enough blouse and the neck is big enough that you can actually slip it over your head. You don't really need an opening. Of course, you can put one in if you want. I would suggest if you do want an opening, either make a row of buttons or hooks in the side seam or along one side of the stomacher in the front. Then I'll just sew it down following the seam line of where I hemmed it so that there aren't too many seams running up and down the front. I wanted to keep the lines as basic and simple as possible, leaving a little bit of overhang to define the separation between the stomacher and the rest of the blouse. Next came time to drape the lapels. Because I was using gosh, I think they were handkerchiefs. I was a little limited in exactly how long I could make them, but I thought that the embroidery and the lace was just so of the right decade that I decided to use them on this blouse. So I was a little limited as far as how far down I could go with them because they were already a fixed length. If you're cutting them out from scratch, then you have all the length in the world and you can actually have them go from waistline to waistline or hemline to hemline up over the back. But because I was dealing with a fixed length, this is about how far down I could make it and still have room for a little overhang in the back. And I think it turned out very nicely. So we're almost to the finish line. I'm sewing the right side of the collar to the wrong side of the blouse so that when I turn it over, it has a soft and loose look, but will still be firmly sewn in place. When you're making it up as you go, you really have to stand back and look at it often to make sure that it's turning out exactly as you want. Catching things that don't line up or didn't work out quite as you had in mind are harder to fix the further along you get. But I think this turned out pretty good. I'm happy with the drape. I'm happy with how the handkerchiefs are behaving next to the new fabric. I'm happy with the color of the vintage cloth versus the color of the new cloth. And I think it's going to be a lovely little blouse. Now I have a little bit of leftover lace from around the handkerchief edge that I didn't use. And they're just long enough to go around the sleeves. So that's where I put them. I'm sewing the edging lace onto the sleeves with the right sides together. Then I opened them up and top stitched it down flat. Trim the edges very close to the top stitch. And since this is just an embellishment and not a load bearing seam, it shouldn't come unraveled or anything. And the last thing for me to do is hem the bottom. I think I'm making it about a quarter of an inch here. Just a note, I didn't sew the stomach panel to the rest of the blouse all the way down to the end. I left about two inches open at the bottom to let it move independently. I think it'll look a lot better when I'm actually wearing it if those are open ever so slightly at the bottom. And that's it, we're done. Here are some final shots of the finished product. A lovely little blouse from around the 19 teens that I don't personally think would be out of place in the first couple seasons of Downton Abbey. And keep an eye out for one of my next videos where I will make a historically inspired skirt to go with it. But for now, until next time, bye!